many thanks for that. Thanks for the invitation to uh, speak today. Shoot, don't shoot. Go, no go. Almost every type of mission or operation involving the application of air power at some stage includes a yes-no decision point which once taken is irreversible. Point of no return. The sharpest of these is the decision to release a weapon with the aim of creating a certain effect. But alongside effects, there are also consequences. And as recent events in the Syrian desert serve to remind us, these may not always be quite what we had in mind. Unintentional airstrikes have a habit of leading to unintended consequences. In the current context, it is not an exaggeration, in my opinion, to state that these have the potential to take us to the brink of World War III. In spite of their simple format, yes, no decisions of this nature are anything but straightforward. They take place at the end of a long chain of decision making, whose final result is to set up the likelihood of success or failure once that critical point is reached. At this point, the consequences of error are no less than potentially catastrophic. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the risk cannot be avoided because the risk arises not only from the decision to go, but often in equal measure from the decision not to go. A failure to provide close air support on October the 2nd and 3rd, 2015, for the beleaguered forces inside the Kunduz Provisional Government Governor's Compound and the relief convoy that was headed towards it presented just as high a potential for disaster as did the decision to open fire on a T-shaped building in the city, even though important aspects of the C-130's targeting process had been degraded by earlier events that night. In this case, the actual result was the worst of both worlds. Not only was the Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, trauma centre destroyed in the airstrike, but the critical relief convoy was left to proceed without any air cover whatsoever. It was only a matter of luck that they made it through to their objective. If they had failed, the city would have almost certainly have fallen to the insurgents, and if Mosul is an indicator, would still be in the hands today. This is Kunduz we're talking about, if you follow the news. Now, it's widely recognised that situational awareness forms a key element in this kind of decision making. The Kunduz airstrike bears this out too. <coughs> on October 2nd and 3rd, the level of SA was in fact minimal. Not only SA in relation to the operating environment, for example, for those who know, JIPOE hadn't been written, didn't exist. But also, for example, on the disposition of friendly forces around the city. The only maps with information of this nature available to the AC-130 crew were 48 hours old. Useless. One consequence of this was that the most extreme risk at the time of the airstrike was in fact a friendly fire incident. Once again, it was only luck that that did not eventuate. Now, an overlay of green forces, or an overlay of blue and green forces within the city of Kunduz would certainly have been helpful to the air crew tasked with, provider pro task, task with providing them close air support. An idea of the location of red forces would likewise not have hurt had this information been known. A no strike list that included the MSF trauma center, schools, mosques, and other buildings not to be targeted, would certainly have complemented an operator screen on board C-130U, now suitably filled with red, blue, green dots. It is certainly true that such a picture would have minimized the risk of friendly fire at least. <coughs> it would not, however, have made any difference 
to 285 people inside the MSF hospital facility, 42 of whom were shortly to lose their lives. For while the absence of good SA did not assist the air crew with their mission, it also played little role in the series of decisions that led up to the airstrike on the trauma center. In this process, it was a faulty understanding of the situation, rather than poor SA, that proved decisive. Not only so, but rather than poor situational understanding being the result of minimal SA, it was in fact the other way around. The jock, for example, who were following the mission, monitoring the mission, and who had an ISR asset under their control, allocated this asset to the wrong building altogether, believing, understanding, believing this to be the convoy's objective. For this reason, it missed the entire engagement. The focus of its ASA effort being on a completely different part of the city. The air crew, meanwhile, believed they were observing an insurgent C2 node, not a hospital. And the ground forces commander, who called in the airstrike, understood the same C2 node to be the source of heavy weapons fire gun pinning down the convoy in his immediate vicinity. The convoy was in reality some nine kilometers away, not under fire and probably not even underway. Now the lesson from this example of catastrophic error is not that SA should not be considered important, essential even, element within military decision making of the application of air power. Instead, it shows why situational awareness has such a crucial role to play in assisting and shaping a full and accurate appreciation of the situation. SA that does not contribute to situational understanding or is overridden by a faulty understanding, can do little to improve the likelihood of a successful outcome once go, no-go decision point is reached. This is an important consideration to bear in mind, because an enormous effort and investment is now underway to improve the capability of the ADF to achieve good levels of SA in any foreseeable situation. 2016 white paper, for example, flags the creation of no less than 900 new positions whose overriding objective is to generate good SA. It's not how we always describe intel, but really, it's not a bad definition. This is a worthy goal. The problem, however, is that this challenge is largely understood as a technical one. To do with the obstacles in the way of interoperability, with the integration of sensors, systems and networks. The great bulk of resources to be invested in SA production are earmarked for these technical aspects of the problem. The limitation of this approach lies its underestimation of the human factor. Charles has just been talking about this too. In the white paper, the human resource challenges surrounding the upgrade of ISR capabilities are mentioned only once in the context of a need to train operators effectively in the new equipment as it comes online. However, if the main benefit of good SA lies in its contribution towards a sound appreciation of the situation, then it follows logically that an increased investment into SA generation needs to be matched by a corresponding improvement in the ability to transform SA into solid situation understanding. Understanding, interpretation, this is a human facility. Technical systems can aid this, sometimes in invaluable ways. <laughs> Nevertheless, the process is, in its essentials, a human one. In Kunduz, the main indicator that disaster was looming lay in the fact that of the five components actively participating in the mission, that's the AC-130U, the ground force inside the PGOV, the convoy, the jock, and Afghan partner forces, okay, each had their own appreciation of the situation. It was not only different from the others, but contradictory. 
It was this mutual confusion between human actors that was the single greatest factor in the tragedy. Technical systems have an important role to play in preventing this kind of situation. It is, in fact, one of the key goals behind the effort to make a common operating picture, COP, available to everyone involved in a joint and combined decision-making environment. Too often, however, the COP is understood literally, and I mean this, literally as dots on a screen. As if this is a set the critical element separating success from failure in a go-no-go -go decision. Kundu shows us this is too narrow an approach. In this case, the absence of dots on the screen had little impact on the outcome. Instead, the critical factors included the quality of verbal communications between components, mutual understanding of each other's <coughs> situation, the various problems and difficulties they were grappling with, crews in the air and on the ground. And above all, the core of the issue lay in a collective failure to resolve a problem satisfactorily. Namely, the challenge presented by the need to provide air cover to a convoy with no embedded JTAC, no line of sight to the forces inside the PGOV from where the cast strikes were directed. The solution that was proposed and eventually implemented was always unworkable. I'll talk about this in my book. Unfortunately, this was not picked up. Nor was any acceptable alternative found in the time available. Now, the time available was between six and eight hours. Okay. That was when the con up for the convoy movement was first developed. And that was when the problem of how do we provide them air cover without a JTAC, without line of sight. Six to eight hours. The failure, in other words, was not a technical failure, it was an organisational failure. The CENTCOM investigation into the airstrike makes this clear. This is not the only example. We go. This is not the only example that highlights the limitations of an over-concentration on dots on the screen. A number of cases explored in the book, Shoot, Don't Shoot, currently in Press Air Power Development Centre, bring out other dimensions of the problem. Okay. So these include the dynamic, dilemma faced by the anti-air warfare team inside the combat information center of the USS Van Sant. I'm not sure if that's actually the one, but it's the photo you can find on Google. <coughs> Who were faced with determining the identity and intent of track number TUN4131 as it departed from Bandar Abbas, a joint use military civilian airport. The AAW team had to choose between two options. A civilian airliner on a regular scheduled run to Dubai, or an Iranian F-14 making an attack run on the ship. Those were the two options. Okay. The dots on the screen revealed 10 possible indicators as to which of the two was TN4131. Okay. This is what they had to work with. Okay. Dots on the screen, 10 systems. Items of value, you can see them up there. We actually use this in the training that we do around HC. We actually ask people, we've got four minutes, work it out, make a decision. Okay. You can see what they were there. The problem is, and this is a little bit of a spoiler if you do the training, but I'll jump ahead. Okay. The spoiler is, <coughs> every single one of these items is ambiguous. It was ambiguous. Okay. No determination was possible on the basis of dots on the screen. In the training we go through this, one by one, every single one, ambiguous, one way or the other, you can't do it. Instead, the decision, the actual decision, was made on an entirely different basis. Okay? Different kind of source. This was the insum, intelligence summary that had been provided to the crew of the USS Vincent for that July the 4th holiday weekend. Unlike the dots on the screen, right, this was unambiguous. It said, expect an attack. And it was this estimate, estimate, understanding, interpretation, it was this estimate of the situation that was a critical factor in the decision to shoot down what later turned out to be Iran Air Flight IR-655. 
Now this enzyme was not only a human product, it was also, actually, it was highly controversial. And it was highly controversial before the incident. Okay. So analysis came under criticism from at least one other commander within the US Gulf Task Force. And that controversy reflected a long-standing disagreement within the leadership team as to how Iran's recent behavior in the region should be interpreted. Interpreted, understanding. Okay. And even as to the nature of their own mission. They disagreed and they argued. At opposite ends of the dispute lay Captain Rogers of the USS Vansan and Captain Carlson of the USS Sides. This disagreement erupted in an open row during another incident involving an Iranian warship. Okay. And the senior commander had to intervene, and he actually intervened on the side of the more junior of the two, Captain Carlson. Three weeks later, coming back to this incident, the anti-air warfare team on board the USS Sides okay, did correctly identify TN4131 as IR655. Okay. The information they had, though, was exactly the same. Okay. Same dot, same screen. Okay. Same anti-air warfare team, same CIC, smaller ship, but similar. Okay. Same information that was available to the USS Vansen crew. Unfortunately, they were unable to influence the course of the engagement. Okay. So see where we're going here. Okay. Same dots, same screen, same technical information. It's all ambiguous. One crew, the captain, has one interpretation of the situation, of their mission. This goes on for weeks. Other captain, different understanding, reads the some differently, different decision. See where we're going. In both cases, IR655, MSF Trauma Center, situation understanding proved critical, not dots on the screen. And it was a faulty understanding of the situation, namely an underestimation of the risk of a civilian airliner departing Bandar Abbas being shot down by mistake, that led the Vincennes to overlook a simple remedy which would have significantly improved their level of SA. So the point here again is it's SA that can drive, sorry, it's situational understanding that can drive your SA. Where you put your, where you allocate your assets, what you're looking for. Okay. In this case, it was the provision, the simple remedy, was the provision of a VHF handset for listening into tower radio traffic at the nearby airport. This would have extended the window of opportunity for identifying IR655 from four, which is what they had, to 20 minutes. As soon as the airliner informed ATC that they'd pushed off from the gate, departure gate. Okay. No sophisticated IT network was required. Just a simple handheld radio. Okay. They didn't have one. Okay. And a recognition of how important it was to be able to clearly distinguish a military from civilian aircraft movement from Bandar Abbas, the Joint Use Airport. Yet another illustration of the limits to technical conception, a third case study. This was a 1994 friendly fire incident in northern Iraq. When a flight of F-15 shot down two Black Hawk helicopters transporting 24 friendly VIPs, including their own ground force commander. Okay. Here the pilots were presented with the task of identifying two targets flying low and slow inside a designated no-fly zone. None of the technical systems available, including IFF interrogation, gave any indication that these were friendly aircraft, nor were they listed on the pilot's copy of the ATO, a tasking order. This set up a strong expectation among the pilots that what they were looking at, the targets, were Iraqi M24 Hinds, and that appeared to be confirmed when they made a visual ID pass. It was at this point the real problems began. The least of these lay in the misidentification of the two helicopters. That is in poor SA. <coughs> and seeing red when they should have seen blue or white. The real reason, or the real problem, was why the pilots made this error. And it turns out that the F-15 flight did not have access to some vital information. And without this, their interpretation, understanding, of the data in front of them was distorted. Fatally so. Information gaps included an understanding of how friendly Black Hawk movements were handled in theater. 
as well as the frequent presence inside the no-fly zone of Turkish Air Force assets. I think if they shut down Turkish Air Force by mistake. UN helicopters were also there. None of these were on the ATO. Never, every day. The pilots, however, therefore, were not in any position to consider these as possibilities when faced with unidentified tracks on their radars, and they didn't. <coughs> Even worse, however, the pilots also had a faulty appreciation of their own mission. On the positive identification of Iraqi aircraft in the no-fly zone, the pilots believed their task was simply shoot them down. So no fly zone, shoot them down, which they did. This was not their commander's intent at all. Nor was it how violations of the no-fly zone had been handled in the past. If the helicopters were Iraqi, the primary task was to uncover just what they were doing there. In other words, what was their intent? One possibility, for example, was that this was a defection underway. Do we want to shoot them down? Maybe, maybe not. For this task, dots on the screen could provide little to go on, even if they were the correct color. What was needed was a mobilization of Operation Pride Comfort's intelligence capability to come up with a plausible assessment of the situation, and on this base to work out an appropriate course of action, of which there were several alternatives. This lay beyond the scope of the F-15 pilots, but time was available to bring the organization's resources to bear on the problem. Okay. None of these considerations were taken into account by the pilots who telescoped the decision-making process into a few short minutes. They did so because their understanding of the situation, including their own mission, the ROE, the commander's intent, and how rotary aircraft movements were handled in theater, was at fault in several crucial respects. This did not only apply to the two pilots concerned, but in fact the entire F-15 squadron at the time. Once again, we are dealing with an organizational failure, one for which there are no technical solutions. So the argument then is this. Investment in SA is a sound decision, but only if it serves proper situation understanding. And this is above all a human element. It is an organizational challenge. It is the same challenge that the HCD program seeks to address. This is a management program with the goal of minimizing the risk of catastrophic error. Once we reach that point of no return, go, no go, shoot, don't shoot. Thank you. I remember with the Vincennes episode, I was speechwriter to the Chief of Navy, and he was very keen Ooh. to have our ships involved in the Armilla Patrol, the tanker war. Really? And then that happened. Uh, he lost his enthusiasm for it, and Kim Beasley, the offset, was that he was support Kim Beasley to acquire Tomahawk missiles. Never came to anything, but certainly that Vincennes episode was a really big deal in terms of the Navy's view of how space management or air management was being run at that time. Any questions, please? Hey, look, uh, just an interesting point you make about the increase to 900 uh, of the intelligence, uh, uh, the analysis side of stuff. One of the other solutions, obviously, is the automation of analysis uh, of the significant amount of data that's going to be collected. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of your uh, views on situational understanding when we get into the situation of black box analysis where if data goes in, uh, understanding or awareness comes out and we don't know the processes by which that actually occurred? Do you see that as a risk or something that we can mitigate or, uh, once again, that's a black box in itself? That's, that's a very interesting question. It's a big question. Um, there are different ways of approaching the program, and there are di the problem, and there are different solutions that are being advocated. So, big data, and the more efficient processing and manipulation of big data is one of the solutions that people are going down to. And obviously, that's an IT-based technical solution. The technology exists to facilitate that. So, a lot of money and a lot of investment, particularly in the U.S., like big, big numbers, are going into that solution. I think, yes, you can go down that avenue, you can take it up to a point, but it's like dots on a screen. It gets you to a point, and beyond that point, we need people, and we need people not as, just as individuals, but working in teams and in an organizational context. So I'm not opposed to that, but I'm saying it should be 
balanced. It should be a match. Spend the money on the sensors. Spend the money on the networks. We need into it. We need a common operating picture. We want the dots on the screen. It's not an argument against that, but it's saying if you're going to make an investment that runs into the billions, then surely you should make a corresponding investment of something. And I'm not. I don't have a number, but something yeah, to balance that up to make sure you're getting bang for your buck. Okay. Because when you analyse events, this is my expertise is analysing when it goes catastrophically wrong. I don't see technical failures, I see organisational failures. I see people put in impossible situations like the crew. Four minutes, make a decision. You've got nothing you can work with. And it's too late. Okay? So it's a balance. Now what is the correct balance? Let's discuss. I don't know. Let's talk about it. But it's not one line in the white paper that says we need to train people to operate this gear better. I don't think that's the correct balance. Yeah, hi, Dirk, uh, Chris McGuinness. Um, I think you kind of answered it, but I'd, you know, you talked about SA and SU. You can almost align those with observe and orient in the. Yes, in I'm the glad Oodaloo. you said that. I, I um, made that note when right, I came cool. up this morning. Yeah. Um, so, uh, one of my bugbears and people who were at various conferences have heard me complain about this before, but you, you only observe through the lens of your orientation that you already bring into a particular situation. So. Your SU um, comes from far more than the insum you got the day before. It comes from all the education and training you've had up until that point. So this is a long way of asking. If you were Minister for Defence, where would you spend money to improve uh, uh, almost the wetware, the, the bio-organic processing systems that we, that we bring to the party? Um. That's a very good question too. And it's kind of the question which I don't answer because I ran out of time, but I would well, that's the obvious where we, where do we, what does this mean, where does we go next, and what can we do? And before I do that, I'll just say, <clears throat> there's an aspect of this that's actually good news. Okay, so when we do the training, when we put, and in real situations, when you have go, no, go, shoot, don't shoot, often it's rapid, we call it rapid military decision making. It's on the spot, fighter pilots, it's fractions of a second. These are the decisions you have to make, hesitate or die. Okay, so. All that's true, but once we widen our scope and once we understand, this is what I've done by looking at these case studies, is once you actually look at it, then we see that the time frame for the decision making is actually much bigger. And that's good news because it gives us something to work with. Okay? And this is, what I, this is what got me started on it. I started with the Van Sen, four minutes, what do you do? Well, yeah, but if they'd had a VHF radio, now that decision was actually four years before they decided to quit them whatever, yeah? But there were a whole series of other decisions that shaped that four minutes long before the four minutes started, okay? That's good news because that gives us stuff to work with. So what that is, is actually lots of things, but they are organizational things. That's why I say <coughs> F-15 pilots didn't understand their mission correctly. Well, that was true every day. Those particular pilots were there for three, four weeks. The F-15 squadron had been there for six months. You've got six months to fix it. So in that sense, it's good news, okay? Um, where do we go? Well, it's all, it's all the usual stuff. It's, you know, it's training, it's organisational culture, it's leadership, it's whatever. And, and I, if I had time, I, I would expand on that. There's lots of things we can do. Generally, I'd say it's, it's not as bleak as it sounds, because once you broaden your perspective, there's lots we can do, there's lots we can tackle. Am I right in presuming that we can take our tear power and, for instance, put in army snipers? Any shoot, don't shoot decision. Right. It, it's as broad as that. And in a civilian context, anywhere where there's a risk of catastrophic yeah. error, with a go, no go. There's one here, and there's one there. Okay. Just here first, then. Ah, here. Uh, thank you, Peter Hobbins, Sydney Uni. Um, thanks, Dirk. In these high consequence environments. Uh, there's also usually a high impact inquiry afterwards as well. And in say, for instance, the uh, commercial airline world, it's not uncommon after a major accident or incident to run repeated simulator exercises to gauge not only how the crew acted on in that circumstance, but how other equivalently trained crew would deal with that situation. And I just wondered, does that sort of analysis often occur in these environments, or is that a a potentiality, particularly in terms of allocating responsibility slash culpability to individuals given the scenario they, they've gone through versus organisational factors? 
I'm not sure it's a question of versus, but that's also a very interesting question. And commercial aviation is interesting from this too. So anyone who's followed this will know that up until 1970s, 80s, any accident that happened and they did an investigation, you know what they're going to say the cause was, pilot error. Okay? Now in the commercial, in the safety world, there's a few here will know this, so the thinking has gone way beyond that. And it's gone way beyond that because now we understand the first thing you need to question is, well, why did the pilots make an error? So part of my, my answer to you, because this also came up with the Van Sen, all these incidents, the, the, the thing is that if somebody does something stupid, or they're untrained, or, or it's unprofessional, or they're just incompetent. Well, that's one thing. But if they do something that pretty much all of us in the same situation would do, that's a different question. That's a different problem. Blaming the individual is not going to help you. Okay? You ha have to look at it from a more organizational perspective. Now, when we do this training, for example, we, we do this. So we, you're in the, come do the HCD training, you're in the pilot of the F-15, and we will give you the the same information, and we will walk through the decision-making process. And I'll tell you, it's another spoiler, everybody, without exception, shoots those helicopters down. Okay? So that means if we're going to change something in the equation to get a different result, which we want, it's, you can't focus on the cockpit. You've got to focus somewhere else. So that's a di it's a shift in thinking how we approach this. And, but it's not bad news, because actually we've got heaps to play with. If it's just a bad pilot, then you look at... In the Vincennes, they looked at their combat stress, they looked at psychological factors, and, and basically they blamed some individuals. Well, what's the solution? Sack them, replace them. Well, yeah, OK. But if we bright, broaden it out and think, well, let's look at a training, let's look at systems, let's look at procedures, you know, sometimes technical aids too, we've got so many more tools to work with to minimise the risk of catastrophic error. So it's actually a good news story from that perspective. But do, do people just sack someone? Do most organisations follow through, as you are suggesting, to those broader systemic factors, or is it just enough to sack someone to assuage the public and politicians if need be? Well, yeah, that's a prob that, that's a problem. And it's partly a natural problem because families of victims and so on, they want accountability, they want someone held account, so there's often this so there's a lot of pressure on the decision makers, the decision makers to do that. In Kunduz, uh, the Ground Force Commander copped it. I think that's unfair. You'll see why I think that's unfair on him. He was put in an impossible position, in my opinion. Okay? And we would have done something similar to him. So yes, that does happen, and it is a problem. <coughs> it's just complicated, is what you're saying. Yes. There's a whole range of factors other than leading to the outcomes that you always like. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Last question, Steve. Thank you. More, more a comment. Uh, in my previous career in the Navy, we studied the Vincennes as an upstream supervisor. Um, and I'd like to note, there was at least one person commented on when you when you listen to the the voice recordings come from the ship. There was a, an operator there who actually made the, the right call. Yes. But because the, they'd gone into a war fighting bloodthirsty mode, it was pretty much palmed off. Um, I think our training in crew resource management helps a lot uh, in, in the ADF to, to avoid those sorts of situations where we will accept the junior operator going, hang on a minute, that's not right, and that'll be listened to and actioned on. Um, that's happened for me in the Middle East on HMAS Anzac where we nearly shot down two F-18s coming back from Iraq. Um, at that time, just before we liberated Iraq, some would say invaded, um, it was a non link 16 fitted ship, dots on the screen coming really low, really fast at the northernmost coalition unit, and the, op the war fighting, the war fire, warfare officer was in the having a cup of tea. There was a break, it was a benign environment, it was about two o'clock in the morning. Um, the crew, the ops crew, trying to find the, war the warfare officer, went through that self defense process. We're going to have to engage these. It was a junior operator who was on the radio to someone else um, who got from a UK asset, hey, they're friendly, return, they're friendly forces, they're returning forces, <coughs> even though they weren't squawking. Uh, mode four, mode one, mode two, any, anything. So uh, I challenge the, there's no technological solutions. If we were in a network force, we would know who everyone is. Um, and I think that's a Jericho Nirvana um, that we're striving for. But, uh, but yeah, I, I guess it's more of a comment that I think within 
all these scenarios here in an ADF environment, we have the organisational um, training, we have the organisational structure and, and that, that trust in our operators that I don't think many of those would have actually happened in our environment today. Can I respond? Yeah. Please. Um, I wonder how many more stories um, there are like this out there. Um, it's my first comment. Um, CRM I'd like to come back with because that's very important. But just, just without being belligerent, let me come straight back to you, but technical solution. And I would argue that a technical solution to say, let's say, call it IFF, all right? So <coughs> identification friend or foe, avoiding friendly fire. Now I will argue, <laughs> we can debate, I will argue a technical solution is in principle excluded. Okay. Why? Because it's the nature of warfare. Okay. When you have an adversary, okay, friendly, fire, friendly fire has always existed in warfare and I, it will always be a problem. Sometime, sometimes you're on top of it, other times it goes badly wrong. But it always exists, you can never solve it, it is in the nature of warfare. Why? Because the challenge is you want to identify your people clearly so you get the best possible systems that you can do that. An adversary, what are they going to do? They're going to copy it. Okay? So you're pushed in two different directions. Yeah? Sophisticated, encrypted, whatever. Yes, yeah, sure. The more complex it is, the more likely you'll get it wrong. Make a mistake. Okay? The more simple it is, the more likely the adversary copies it. We're always navigating somewhere in there. Here, here. You never eliminate. That, that's my response, yeah? So there never is, in principle, a technical solution to IFF, I would argue. Okay? We always live with it. Catastrophic error is always a factor in military operations. You never get rid of it. Don't buy my book and think it goes away. No. Right? No. Right? It is a fact of life. But we can work it, we can manage it, we can reduce it. Technical systems <coughs> certainly have their place, so long as we understand <coughs> the limits. And I won't say more. CRM, I would like to talk about. CRM is very important as well, uh, part of it. Well, I can already predict that conversation during the afternoon tea. We'll have a brief break, uh, just about 10 minutes or so. We'll come back for our final session and wrap up. Thanks very much.